Being a pastor in the remnant movement, it is my duty to be a faithful watchman on the wall. I must alert all those remnant Christians out there that are being led into apostasy by following after the corrupted teachings of mankind. So, I pray this sermon is accepted as a warning to those who may be on the fence on this topic. There is a booklet moving in certain circles that is titled, What Did the Pioneers Believe? that needs the light of truth placed upon it. It is directly focusing on bringing ex-SDAs and new brethren in the remnant movement back into apostasy with Rome. With the Holy Spirit's assistance, I will share with you what the Word of our God says about the message I found in this strange booklet. I will not go line by line throughout this booklet at this time because of what I found early on while looking into this. Perhaps soon I will do an in-depth study line by line if the need arises. But for now, I will only touch on areas that will provide the remnant people the necessary ammunition to combat this assault on God's truth. Hopefully the truths I share here will give those that are thinking of joining this movement enough evidence to see that it is clearly not of God. Before I even reached page one of this strange booklet, I found something rather bizarre in the table of contents under the section titled J. M. Stevenson, which is something they cover on page 16. It says, note, Although Stevenson made a statement promoting the idea that Christ is a created being, with which the publishers cannot agree, and therefore it has been deleted, his article is included for its valuable Bible teachings. He, along with Uriah Smith and one statement by J.N. Loughborough in 1855, are the only early Adventists I know of who put this idea in print. In 1855, one year after Stevenson wrote this article, he left the movement, Uriah Smith, in his first printing of Thoughts on the Revelation in 1867, taught that Christ was created, but he soon revised his understanding, and in later printings of Daniel and Revelation, he deleted all such statements and added strong statements against this idea, bringing him in harmony with the rest of the brethren. Not only are they allowing someone they know to be preaching heresy to speak for them, they actually admit he left the movement one year after doing the study they placed in their strange booklet. Yes, Uriah Smith later recanted the strange doctrine of Jesus being a created being, but J. N. Loughborough never did as far as I can see. Yet, he is also allowed to have his say on page 35. What is obvious here is a mixing of truth with error so as to preach a new doctrine as if it is new light. Problem is, new light never contradicts old light. For it is plainly written in Isaiah 8.20 to the law and the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. What they are doing in this doctrinal brochure is called confusion, which is not of our God, as many of us are very aware. In fact, that is the main fruit of Roman Catholicism, or Babylon as prophecy calls it today. The word Babylon actually means confusion by mixing in the Old Testament, and just plain confusion in the New Testament. This is how Satan has always worked through Roman Catholicism. He mixes just enough truth with error to make it believable to the unsuspecting souls the authors of this doctrinal brochure allow men they admit advocate heresy to preach unto the bride of Christ as if they are trusted men of God. What does the word of our God in heaven say about such an act as this? It says in 1 Corinthians 10 21, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. For those that compile the spurious doctrine pamphlet to suggest it's okay to use statements from people documented to not only be heretics, but Outside the original faith is no different than Christians listening to non-believing politicians that quote from the Bible. After all, is this not how Rome was able to merge paganism with Christianity long ago? On page one of this strange booklet, they quote Ellen White, where she says, God has given me light regarding our periodicals. What is it? He has said that the dead are to speak. How? Their works shall follow them. We are to repeat the words of the pioneers in our work who knew what it cost to search for the truth as for hidden treasure and who labored to lay the foundation of our work. What I would like to highlight is the fact that Sister White said we are to repeat the words of the pioneers in our work who knew what it cost to search for the truth as for hidden treasure and who labored to lay the foundation of our work. The authors of this booklet, on the other hand, admit in writing within their table of contents that J.M. Stevenson, as well as J.N. Loughborough, are not pioneers that have adhered to our work at all. In fact, they admit Stevenson left the work within a year after writing the article they placed in their doctrinal brochure. Now, most are unaware of this, but this is an age-old tactic of Roman Catholic prelates. They claim an act is wrong to do in one sentence, 
and then confirm it is wrong to do in another, while in fact doing the very thing they say is wrong to do in the first place. Do their methods confuse you? Well, of course they do. That's the main fruit of Babylon. That's how it works. They dazzle with craftiness. When Sister White was talking about the pioneers that do our work, she was not in any way, shape, or form saying it was okay to repeat the words of those that do not do our work. They also quoted Sister White from the same book on page 29 where she said, the truths that have made us a people, what we are, leading us on step by step. But I got to ask, how can J.M. Stevenson or J.N. Loughborough be leading anyone step by step? The authors of this doctrinal brochure admitted in writing these men sidestepped the truth when declaring Jesus was a created being. How can they be leading anyone step by step when their steps lead off the path of Christ's written and sacred truth? For the authors of the strange booklet to say Ellen White agrees with proven heretical pioneers that left the movement are trustworthy is nothing short of a bold-faced lie built heavily upon Babylonian confusion. And to claim she agrees with them by using her words as a blanket statement is seen by those with eyes that see to be deliberately deceptive as well. Now, I make no apologies for my boldness here because I have been taught that as a watchman on the wall, I must be very blunt at times. This is a very dangerous booklet, to say the least, and I will not beat around the bushes because I cherish the desk I am called to speak from. As you're about to see, it quite brazenly ignores many clear spirit of prophecy statements as well as enlightening scriptures in order to preach this strange doctrine of theirs. Now, all throughout this booklet, you're going to find out-of-context statements from Ellen White as well as some pioneers claiming the Holy Spirit is nothing more than a thought process of the Father or the Son and Jesus is not to be considered a God. To further push their deception, you will not see one statement from Spirit of Prophecy in this doctrinal brochure wherein Sister White does, in fact, declare there are three separate persons in the Godhead. For example, if you enter three living persons into the Spirit of Prophecy CD or do so on the Ellen White website, you will find five statements made by Sister White, the first of which is the following. The Comforter that Christ promised to send after he ascended to heaven is the Spirit in all the fullness of the Godhead, making manifest the power of divine grace to all who receive and believe in Christ as a personal Savior. There are three living persons of the heavenly trio. In the name of these three great powers, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, those who receive Christ by living faith are baptized, and these powers will cooperate with the obedient subjects of heaven in their efforts to live the new life in Christ. Sister White also stated the following, which is not shared in their doctrinal brochure either. She said, We need to realize that the Holy Spirit, who is as much a person as God is a person, is walking through these grounds. Now, keep in mind, the authors of this strange booklet do in fact declare Sister White to be a prophet. And as is common knowledge, prophets are inspired. However, pioneers are not inspired. On page 8 of their doctrinal brochure, they actually go so far as to say, every statement from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy on this subject must be given a chance to speak, and we must go with the weight of evidence. Yet, nowhere in their strange booklet do you see the previous quotes I just shared. They are strangely and utterly missing. The reason they refuse to list such comments from Ellen White is because to share them would be to expose all their quotes as completely out of context. Yes, they claim spirit of prophecy and the word of God are inspired, but as you read their doctrinal brochure, they put forth the assumption repeatedly that the pioneers should be trusted over and above the word of God. What does our Lord say will happen when we ignore his written word on such easy-to-research matters as these? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 and 12 says, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved, and for this cause God shall send them a strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned, who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. This is why many of them believe it, because they have denied the truth, they don't love the truth, and so now a strong delusion is upon them. After they claimed Ellen White was a prophet in their emails to me, I shared the previous quotes from special testimonies that I just shared a moment ago regarding how she speaks of the three living persons in the Godhead. This is what they said to me regarding her statements. You mentioned Ellen White, but she isn't to be used to prove Bible truth. In one breath, they declare she is a prophet, 
and in the very next, they declare you cannot use her to prove Scripture. Yet they do exactly that in their strange booklet on pages 1 through 8. On those eight pages, they repeatedly quote from Sister White to try to prove that which they preach is Bible truth and backed by an inspired prophet. But when I share the quotes from her that prove they took her out of context, they declared she is not to be used to prove Bible truth. Even stranger still is the fact that when I shared Bible verses with them, they declared them to be worthy of deletion. When I shared 1 John chapter 5, verse 7 with them, which says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, their response to that inspired Bible verse was, that verse is not supposed to be in the Bible. After stating spirit of prophecy cannot be used to prove Bible truth, and then saying a Bible verse should be removed, how can they say on page 8 of their strange booklet that every statement from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy on the subject must be given a chance to speak, and we must go with the weight of evidence? How does one give the spirit of prophecy or scripture a chance to speak when you ignore spirit of prophecy and rip out Bible verses that go against their strange doctrine? In other words, they really don't want to discuss the truth. They just want you to follow their lead. Now, some may be unaware of this, but on the Bogus Bibles page on my website where I expose the Vatican for changing the Bibles, this very same verse they say must be removed is one of Rome's favorite verses to remove in all their versions that they help edit. This means the authors of this strange booklet are actually in agreement with Roman Catholic prelates when it comes to changing the Word of God to fit the creeds of men. When I ask those that trust the writings in this strange booklet about the next verses, I get nothing but silence. Matthew 28, 19 says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 4 says, Trust ye not in lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3 says, And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And then Revelation 4, verse 8 says, And the four beasts had each of them six wings about them, and they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Three separate names are mentioned in baptism, so as to make no mistake as to who it is we are to be baptized into. Yet they do not acknowledge the Holy Ghost as part of the Godhead, so there was no explanation offered by them as to why Jesus said what he did about the proper method of baptism that day. What we see here is this. With one verse, they declare it should be deleted from Scripture. Then the next verse, they completely ignore. Keep in mind, this is just two of dozens of verses that have been shared with similar results. As for Jeremiah, Isaiah, and Revelation, making it a point to repeat praises offered to our God three separate times, I need to ask, why do that unless it's to acknowledge three separate beings in the Godhead. And no, this is not Trinitarian at all. The Trinity preaches there is only one God in three persons. Scripture and spirit of prophecy say the Father is a God, the Son is a God, and the Holy Spirit is a God separately. You may find it interesting also to note that the authors of this strange booklet actually use the exact same terminology when describing the Godhead doctrine as does the Roman Catholic Church wherein they say the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son in their Trinitarian doctrine. The Vatican uses the exact same words they do on the official Vatican website. You can see that quote here. Their spurious theology that the Holy Spirit doesn't exist, as well as their counterfeit doctrine that Jesus isn't a God, is a doctrine that also says there is only one God, just like the Trinity of Rome teaches. In fact, their one God doctrine agrees 100% with Roman Catholics, Islam, Israel, pagans, Satanists, Protestants, and Seventh-day Adventists as well. Why do the authors of this doctrinal pamphlet preach this Trinitarian dogma of Rome, you ask? It is because Satan does not have permission to emulate the second coming, wherein the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost will be splitting the eastern sky on that great and dreadful day. Prophetic scripture tells us that Satan only has permission to deceive his subjects as one God when that day comes. This is also why he is called the One in books of the occult to this day. He will stand before all as one God to Christians, one God to Buddhists, 
one God to Muslims, and so on and so forth. For an in-depth look at that prophesied reality, see my Why They Preach One God page on my main website. The bottom line is this. If the Holy Spirit is just a thought process, like they say, then why did the dove appear when Jesus was baptized while the Father's voice came from the heavens? What was demonstrated clearly was God the Father was in heaven speaking. God the Son was on the earth being baptized. And God the Holy Spirit was flying in the air above Jesus. Each separate person of the Godhead and three separate places before the eyes of many on that wonderful day. Could it be that happened in that specific way so as to combat the error that's being preached today? We'll know when we get home. Both the Trinitarian preachers of Rome and the authors of the Spurious Doctrine cannot explain that blunt exhibition of God's glory on that day. They can only ignore it or delete it from their Bibles. So, after all is said and done, do you see a pattern here? I know I do. When I first came across this heresy some time ago about the Holy Spirit not being part of the Godhead or Jesus not being a God, I saw those preaching it ignoring Ellen White in specific areas as well as removing Bible verses in other areas. It wasn't until I saw their statements about J.M. Stevenson and the table of contents of their strange booklet that I made the connection which led to this sermon. So I thank whoever it was that sent me that booklet some time ago. The adding of Stevenson's words, as well as the deleting of spirit of prophecy and scripture that went against their creed, proves their theology is based on whatever their creed has penned. If they find something that goes against their theology, they simply ignore it or delete it. The fact they use Stevenson and Loughborough in their doctrinal brochure in bits and pieces, or use spirit of prophecy in bits and pieces, or rip out Bible verses that go against what they teach, proves this is in fact their agenda. Their creed has become their God. It was stated long ago by Ellen White that Rome withheld the Bible from the people and required all men to accept their teachings in its place. It was the work of the Reformation to restore to men the Word of God. But is it not too true that in the churches of our time men are taught to rest their faith upon their creed and the teachings of their church rather than on the Scriptures? Said Charles Beecher, speaking of the Protestant churches, they shrink from any rude word against creeds with the same sensitiveness with which those holy fathers would have shrunk from a rude word against the rising veneration of saints and martyrs which they were fostering. The Protestant evangelical denominations have so tied up one another's hands and their own that between them all, a man cannot become a preacher at all, anywhere, without accepting some book besides the Bible. There is nothing imaginary in the statement that the creed power is now beginning to prohibit the Bible as really as Rome did, though in a subtler way. And that's what this strange booklet is doing. They remove spirit of prophecy in the strange booklet, and they declare Bible verses worthy of deletion, all for the benefit of keeping their strange creed intact, just as Rome has done for almost 2,000 years. That being said, what is more trustworthy? The Word of God with all its verses intact? The Spirit of Prophecy with all its statements intact? Or this strange booklet put out by those that purposely change the Word of God to follow a man-made creed? Of such as these, our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, said in Matthew 15, verse 9, But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. I am sure some of you listening have the question to ask, Why do they preach or teach this strange theology? Why are they saying Jesus isn't a God and the Holy Spirit doesn't exist? Well, it has to do with a prophetic event that is about to happen worldwide. It also has to do with a prophetic event that is happening right now. The event that is about to happen is, of course, the arrival of Antichrist on earth seeking global worship. The event happening right now is the shaking, wherein God is allowing these strange doctrines to flourish so as to see who will be faithful to him and his written word. Those that refuse to rip out Bible verses to back a creed or disregard statements from his prophets will be used by him to glorify him like no other in the history of the Christian church. As this shaking continues to occur, all people will be tested to see if they will follow the Lord's truth as it is found unmolested in the Holy Scriptures or the lies of those that delete and ignore his scriptures. As always, the choice is still ours as individuals. It is the prayer of this ministry that you make the right choice. Now, for those involved in this strange booklet that purposely ignores the written word of God for the contrived commandments of men, 
All I can do at this point is echo the words of my dear Savior when he said in Matthew 15, verses 7 to 9, Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, The people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. I hope and pray you are blessed by what you heard the Sabbath day.